Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I am delighted to introduce John B. Fullerton. Uh, John is an unconventional economist, impact investor, writer, and philosopher, as well as the architect of regenerative economics. After a successful 20-year career on Wall Street with J.P. Morgan, John listened to a persistent inner voice and walked away in 2001 with no plan but many questions that led him to the creation of the Capital Institute in 2010. His work is a bold reimagination of economics and finance guided by the universal patterns and principles that describe how all healthy, self-sustaining living systems actually work. A committed impact investor, John is the co-founder and chairman of New Day Enterprises, PBC, the co-founder of Grasslands, LLC, and a board member of the Savory Institute and Aqua Safra, as well as an advisor to numerous sustainability initiatives. John, I'm so thrilled to have you here with us. Welcome. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Yay! <laughs> so, um, you are an economist. And well, I'm not a legitimate economist. I, I studied economics as an undergraduate, but, um, but those who are legitimate economists wouldn't consider me an economist. What makes a legitimate economist? You know, having a PhD and, and uh, being published in economics journals. Okay, well, the truth is that you've made a study of economics. Yes, I've been deeply in, entrenched in, in deconstructing economics is probably a better way of describing it. Okay, and you've started the, um, the Capital, Capital Institute. Institute, and that is all about generating a new economy. Yeah. And, yeah. and principles behind it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really started with a question, like, what, why, wh what is it about our economics theory and practice and the financial theory and practice that drives it that is generating uh, so much dysfunction? And um, the dysfunction has only accelerated since I was um, sort of in, enthralled with the question. Um, and um, so it's... It's one of these things where you start peeling back the layers of the onion and it only gets more, more and more um, uh, complex. And so that's been, been the, really the second half of my career has been exploring how to rethink and reinvent economics in a way that will um, actually generate the kind of outcome that most people actually want. So along that line, um, I think because we're talking about economics, I think it would be really helpful to create a foundational definition so people understand what it is, because it's mm. kind of this big, scary, something <laughs> out there thing. Mm. Well, it's a, that's actually an interesting question. I mean, the, the definitional meaning of economics is the, it, it, it's, it comes from the same word as ecology, interesting, uh, the Greek oikonom, oi, uh, oikonomia, uh, which means the, the management of the household, and ecology is the study of the household, different scale households, but um, comes from the same word. But, but you know, the economy is, is the, the sum total of the uh, private and public enterprises that, um, you know, that, that are involved in generating economic activity, you know, from the local shoe store to the World Bank to uh, the government of the United States. And um, 
uh, and everything in between. And you know, we define the economy as this as as you know GDP, gross domestic product, uh, which is simply the sum of the think of it as the sum of the sales or the sum of the um, salaries, income of everyone who works in the in the monetary economy. It ignores all of the things that are not part of the monetary economy. Which happen uh, to be the foundations of life. <laughs> which happen to be everything that matters. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, but yeah, so any any, you know, any caregiving, any volunteer work, uh, any of the natural resources that we just take for granted, like the air we breathe, um, the rain that falls, um, the the oceans, the fish and the rivers, um, none of that is part of the monetary economy until we harvest it and monetize it. Um, but, um, uh, but economics, you know, through, through the study of it, it's actually, there's, there's actually a very interesting story on how it became what it is, which is too long a story to share here, oh. but it's, it's, <laughs> it's remarkably, us. well, the, you know, the, I, I try to think how to, it's remarkably naive. Um, it, you know, neoclassical economics, which is a really big word, is the foundation theory of, of modern economics. Whether you're on the left politically or the right, they're all grounded on this neoclassical framework, which, um, is, which goes back to the um, uh, 19th century. Uh, you know, there was Adam Smith, who was a classical economist. And then, you know, 50 to 100 years later, a bunch of economists developed the foundational theory. And they did it based on Newtonian physics and an assumption that you could essentially export Newtonian laws of physics into economics with an assumption, it was just an assumption. And so particles translated to individuals. It's literally that basic. And unfortunately, we've never gone back and reinvented that framework not based on Newtonian physics, not based on quantum physics, which would be an improvement, but based on biology or living system science, even though the economy by definition is a living system uh, topic because it's comprised of living human beings on a living planet. So clearly the economy that sits, you know, that intermediates the planet and human beings if it's gonna be sustainable, ought to be in alignment with the patterns and principles that we now understand that describe all living systems from our bodies to the rainforest to the entire planet. I'm so glad you went into that story because I think it's really important for people to have a foundational understanding about how dysfunctional our existing system is. We see the dysfunction around us, but we don't right. necessarily know what the, is at the root of it. And you, you nailed it by saying, essentially, we've commodified everything and, and you taken a reductionist view. Yeah, I think the reductionist thinking is the heart of it. Um, you know, commodifying certain things is okay. Um, but commodifying everything is going to be dangerous. But the, to me, from my um, sort of search, the, the crux of it is that, you know, the scientific revolution uh, created this idea of reductionist logic. You know, I think, therefore I am, literally. And that served us really well to do all kinds of things, but mostly to do things that are complicated, like put a man on the moon, or create a cell phone, or um, uh, you know, invent all of the technologies um, that we now rely on. But um, living systems aren't complicated; they're complex, and there's a there's a fundamental difference between what's complicated and what's complex. And and complexity is nonlinear; it's everything's connected to everything. It's it's unpredictable. It, it, the future is literally unknowable. Therefore, it's not manageable. And yet, it's quite easy to manage what's complicated. You figure out the algorithm and you repeat it until you hone it and you have the quote answer. Um, but, uh, I, you know, the health of a human body is not complicated, it's complex. And one person is different from the next person. And I could be exposed to a chemical 
and have a very different reaction than you exposed to the same chemical because we're not the same people. Um, and, and anything that's complex requires holistic decision-making. And I learned this through my work with Savory Institute and Alan Savory, where he practiced, he, he developed this practice of holistic management on large landscapes. Um, and I had this idea, well, if this works on the, in, on the system called the grasslands, why couldn't it work in the system called an economy? Um, and that's really the genesis of, of my work. And it's, it's not, I'm not by any means the first to think of this idea of, of thinking economics through an ecological lens, but I've, I think I've probably taken it to its more, more I've taken it to a more extreme extension of, um, of actually imagining what it would need to look like to get in alignment with uh, living systems patterns and principles rather than sort of niceties like we can't pollute and we can't do this, that, and the other thing. It, it's rather getting clear on the design principles of how living systems actually work. And in particular, this regenerative process, which is the process that living systems um, exhibit in order to that for them to be sustainable or in order for them to be living systems, not dead systems. Maybe you could elaborate on those principles. Um, yeah, so, well, the principles, I mean, again, I, I, I hate to, it's, it's a lot. It's, I, I've tried to reduce it to eight, but that okay. doesn't mean there are eight. That's just one person's best way to describe it. But things like right relationship, like, like in a healthy living system, all of the parts of the system are in symbiotic relationship with each other. So, you know, our cardiovascular system works in symbiotic relationship with our circulatory system and our, um, uh, you know, our, our nervous system. And if they fight each other, if they're in conflict, if they're competitive with each other, um, bad things happen. I, and, I just wanna interrupt for a second because by using this example, you're kind of pointing out the reductionist approach that medicine has taken in so many ways. Exactly, but it's a great, I mean, I'm glad you raised this. This idea of, reductionist logic, losing track of the whole applies to literally everything. It's, it it's the entire enlightenment scientific method that has, um, again, created great advances in everything, including medicine, but left us in this fractured, disconnected, you go to the, in Western medicine, you go to the specialist for this part and this part and this part, but uh, there's, there's no one in Western medicine that it is focusing on the whole, whereas in Eastern medicine and, and many traditional cultures, it, there is a much more holistic ho approach. And so in, integrated medicine is the analog to regenerative economics um, in, in medicine. And really, um, but by the way, it's happening in architecture, regenerative development. Is. It's obviously happening in agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Um, it needs to happen in education, um, which is highly, um, at, atomized uh, in a Newtonian sense. And, and, you know, yeah. if you go, if you want to get a PhD in economics, you're not allowed to say the things I say. Uh, you well, have good to. Well, you don't have a PhD in economics then. <laughs> no, I don't. I wouldn't, I would not get one. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't say that. I mean that literally, I could not get one, you know, writing about what I'm interested in because it, it crosses the disciplines and would be rejected by uh, the, you know, the powers that be in the, in the economics academy. You know, it's so interesting because as we're discussing this paradigm shift, it, it is pervasive and it is a foundational shift of conceptualizing the world. Exactly. And our and, place in it. And our place in it. And it's so interesting when we can identify that it is that reductionist mechanistic view that has led us to where we are and the crisis that crises that we're facing yeah. on all fronts. Yeah. You know, you say, well, it allowed us that kind of thinking allowed us to develop a cell phone, but we didn't develop and while we were developing the cell phone, we didn't look at the ramifications of the cell phone. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, climate change is a symptom of reductionist thinking. Exactly. It, it, we created tremendous advances in human prosperity by harnessing the energy of fossil fuels. But no one understood at the beginning 
that dumping emissions into the sky was going to create literally life-threatening massive uh, catastrophe. And, um, and then once the profit incentive got behind it, those that figured that out, um, no, one, no one wanted to hear that or it was intentionally suppressed by, um, by, the, by the oil companies who had a vested interest to not have that become public. But, you know, Exxon was raising their offshore oil platforms back in like the 1980s. 1980s. It's crazy. There's, it's all documented. There's- well, and, the, and the governments knew, the governments knew, our government knew more than 50 years ago that we were creating climate change. It was defined in governmental documents. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's quite remarkable. Right. Um, so you're a revolutionary, <laughs> I would say. Yes, um, I, 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 it's funny. I, I, what's shocking to me is why this is not obvious to more people. I agree, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I've I've had this conversation with legitimate economists, even Nobel Prize winning economists, and um, they can't. It's not that they're stupid; they're very smart people. Um, but they they somehow can't see a world where uh, we can't solve these problems with technology, and if we have more money, we'll be able to fix that. You know, let's make more money grow the economy faster, create, you know, make a bigger pie so we have the resources to fix the problems later. We've always done that. We'll always be able to do that. Right. Um, it, it, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the 50th anniversary of the limits to growth, the seminal uh, report to the Club of Rome uh, by a group of MIT system scientists in 1970. I think it was actually 73 that was published, but I guess it was written in 72. And um, it was ridiculed at the time. It's still ridiculed and they nailed it. Exponential growth on a finite planet works until it can't work anymore. And, exactly. and we happen to live at the time where that's the chickens have come home to roost. It's really, it's that basic and that profound um, because the implications of that are terrifying to business leaders, to government officials, because the whole economy is built on the assumption of exponential growth forever. Um, that's how you um, create wealth. That's how you pay tax, you know, create a tax base. That's how you can borrow money now to build roads and bridges. If you take that away, um, you know, it's, there's no easy path to a soft landing, put it that way. At least and I haven't figured it out. <laughs> also, also the foundational assumption that GDP somehow reflects health of an economy. Right. Which is just an insane presumption. Right. But we, if, if you get hit by a car on the way home, your ambulance ride to the hospital is good for GDP. Exactly, exactly. But, but in fairness, it doesn't mean that GDP is bad and that there aren't a, there isn't a lot of truth to the to the idea that a growing gdp creates prosperity so it's it's not a it's it's again it's complex it's it's not as simple as either it's true or it's not true it's it's true and it's it's true and it's false at the same time gotcha um, well, let's go you said right relationship and you gave yeah. us an idea of what right relationship is what what's another principle that's so um Another one uh, would be um, trying to think which one to pick first. So I, I love to talk about empowered participation, um, which is again, an idea from living system science. It's not, those aren't my words, I didn't make that up. And what it means is that in living systems, um, all of the parts of the system are empowered to participate in the health of that system. So the example I like to use is that, you know, again, using our human body as an example of a living system, um, our toes and our feet are empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen. Now, that's not just nice for our poor little toes and our poor little feet. Uh, that's not an act of charity on the part of our circulatory system. That's so that our body and therefore our self can benefit from the contribution our toes and our feet make to the health of our whole body. So no toes, no feet, no walking, no running, no soccer, um, no a lot of things. 
and and so what I would like to do is shift the so inequality is obviously the grotesque inequality that we have and that's in, accelerating and that is systemically designed into our current economic system, I'm afraid. I don't really even think by design. I think it, I think it's, you know, we have a long debate about whether it is in there by design or not, but let's assume that it's not, that it's an unintended consequence. And that, you know, most people believe that, you know, that the rising tide lifts all boats is much more the narrative that I think people believe than a more evil narrative of, let's just make a few people rich and everyone else be their, essentially their slaves. <coughs> but um, most of the conversation about fixing inequality is grounded in a moral or an ethical frame, which I happen to agree with, but you don't need to ground it in an ethical or moral framework. Um, and, and frankly, not everyone does agree with that. There are lots of people who think that quote, poor people are poor because they're lazy or stupid or whatever. But if half the country, let's just keep this in the United States for a second, if, you know, if half the country doesn't share the ethical belief that um, we have an obligation to eliminate this grotesque inequality, maybe we will all agree that if we're cutting off the circulation to our toes, it's gonna hurt ourselves. It's in our collective interest to not have a system that does that. And oh, by the way, look outside the window, read the newspaper any day of the week for the last five years, five months, 10 years, and you're seeing the consequences of cutting off circulation to our toes effectively in the real economy. And um, you know whether it's the mental health crisis, the guns crisis, the um, uh, po you know, uh, poverty crisis, the racial, uh, injustice, the racial tension, the violence in our cities, all of that, the political dysfunction, all of it, to me, is, is a simple consequence of having an economic system that cuts off circulation to our toes, the equivalent of that. So why is it so hard to think that we need to align with the way living systems work and, and fix our policies so that that doesn't happen? And there's lots of different ways we could do that. But we first need to understand that it's actually a, a prerequisite for a healthy society, including for the rich people in society. So what would it look like? What could we do to empower participation? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of um, a guaranteed uh, minimum income, uh, or what, what do we call it? Gu guaranteed, uh, there's a different term for it. But... I, I... Not sure, but, but essentially, there's a there's a so so again, I, I I I my views on this are simply look at the living systems principles as our compass. What do they require, and figure out policies that would create guaranteed universal income. Yes, no, that's not even no UUI. It's something it's similar. Anyway, Close. we know we're, we're <laughs> saying, yeah. okay. I I um you know I. I one of, the, one of the things about a, a living system is that it's self-organizing and self-regulating, uh, which is quite interesting. It, it, it is not, you know, the, the analogy is not a big state that hands out benefits to quote poor people to keep them from being poor. That's a big state solution, much more of a um, ideological approach than what could be described as a living systems design. Um, you know, there is no big state managing the healthy vitality of a, of a old growth forest or of a natural river. It happens, quote, automatically, magically. And, and so what is it about that that causes that to be true? And, um, and it's, you know, the the analogy is is you know there's so much it's so complex it's hard to describe but um, uh, for example if everyone um, well let, let me back up for a second and this is drawing on the work of Peter Barnes who's a, a colleague and 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 been thinking about this issue for you know 30 years um, one of the insights that he brings is that um, and and by the way. This idea actually dates back to Thomas Paine. So it's not even, you know, a quote, new idea. 
but um, he he's written a book called Ours, and he talks about co-inherited wealth. So you know, big picture, radical rethinking of the systems that govern our economy. They all date back to essentially the Bretton Woods Agreement. After World War II, we kind of redesigned the world in order to deal with not having, you know, another world war. And we needed to redevelop Europe. And so there was this, the, you know, the IMF and the World Bank, all that stuff was, was born out of the post-war crisis and served us quite well for a long time. But um, what it didn't understand, there was no concept at that time of our economy breaching all of these planetary boundaries um, that is now the new context, the new reality. But we don't have institutions designed to deal with that reality. We have a broken political system that obviously is not dealing with it. And we have a profit generating or profit incentivized, uh, short-term driven capital uh, private sector, which is pretty trapped in that short-term um, mode. So that can't really deal with it, despite honorable efforts to, to, to improve. What we need is an entire new institution, which people are calling the commons sector. And um, what Peter has, has uh, done is, is, is imagined it not just as a kind of a we need to protect the forests for the sake of the forest. We need to protect the Amazon. But rather, if you look at a macro level and you, and, and people have done this, there's a uh, interestingly Nobel Prize economist who has measured the value of the inherit, co-inherited wealth. Uh, everything from the rain that falls, the bees that pollinate, um, but also the technology. So, you know, we were born into a world um, that didn't have microchips and the internet and social media. Anyone born today is born into a world that has microchips, has the internet, has social media, has blockchain. Um, that's incredible wealth that has been, uh, that, that he or she is born into. But be, because of the way we set up our economy, um, he or she doesn't get any inheritance from that. We only get to inherit private wealth. We don't get to inherit our fair share of co-inherited wealth. Um, the Alaska, uh, uh, um, I forget, well, the, the Alaska um, Permanent Fund is an oil fund that is uh, designed as a commons, as co-inherited wealth. You're born in Alaska, you get your share of X amount of money that that is generated from the production of oil in Alaska. That's an example of a commons that is, the value is distributed directly to the citizens in that state. That's a guaranteed minimum income for uh, residents in Alaska. If we applied that same idea to the vast, vast scale of co-inherited wealth, the, the people estimate that it's 80% of total wealth. The private wealth is 20%. In other words, all of the money, all of the stocks and bonds, all of all of that stuff, you add it all up, it's 20% of the total. The other 80% is this co-inherited wealth. And you know, people will debate about whether that's high or low, but the point is the order of magnitude is massive. And yet we've designed our economy to only focus on the private wealth. So if we could set up institutions to manage the commons so that we don't destroy them, and charge people who use them a rent to use them and distribute that money to everyone else who rightly co-inherited that wealth, you would solve the inequality problem and the climate change problem and the water problem and all of these problems in one act. So I can see where you could solve perhaps the poverty problem, but I don't see that it would necessarily um, uh, correct climate change with the example like you're using of Alaska. Yeah. They're, they're making their income from oil. Well, yeah. So Alaska, it's a confusing, it's a bit confusing because it's, it's, you know, they're benefiting from producing oil. The, the, um, the commons that would be protected in the case of climate change would be the atmosphere. 
Now, how we would get from where we are to a global commons, because you know the, the challenge of climate change is that it doesn't matter where the emissions are, are going up um, and it doesn't matter where the sequestration is happening, but, um, but imagine a world, and, and, and again, the thing about complexity is that what is unimaginable today becomes inevitable tomorrow. So I don't limit my thinking to what I could politically explain as possible in the United States in 2022, which is a pretty depressing limited list of stuff. Um, you know, don't get me started. But, um, but imagine a world where there was a fiduciary trust set up uh, with a mandate to protect the commons of the atmosphere with a scientific advisory board that advised, uh, had data every year, there's this much uh, CO2 in the equivalent in the atmosphere. We believe the threshold is this and we're over the threshold. Therefore, we need to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, you're authorized to raise the prices on people who are adding emissions to the atmosphere and you're authorized to pay more money to people who are sequestering CO2. Um, suddenly, you, you know, this would be complicated to manage from where we are to this, but suddenly you have everybody except the polluters benefiting, the higher the price to rent the atmosphere, the more your guaranteed income is. You know, this brings up such a question for me because it's the idea of carbon credits too. Um, it, it's to me, similar, it's more, it's, it's, it's related that the, the carbon credit thing is a I'm tool. Seeing, it's I'm a seeing tool. plastic credits now, yeah, a, no, la, it, a la carbon credit. And yeah, don't let's, let's say I, I, if I, if I can, let's stay away from that because it's hugely complicated, validating that it's real and all that stuff. We can do this without carbon credits. We can do this simply by saying, if you wanna put X tons of carbon in the atmosphere, you need to purchase a permit. Just like if you wanna take fish out of the river, you gotta go purchase a permit and you're only allowed one fish. The, the thing that concerns me is that there are gonna be businesses that purchase those permits and the commons then, the welfare of the commons is dependent upon the selling of those permits. So it makes me think of farmers who have sold rights to minerals or water, um, they're, they're selling the rights and meantime, they're, it's a limited term and it's giving license for abuse of those rights. And I, I have yeah. a challenge with that. No, I, I, I get it. And it, this is, again, this is, this is a, um, this is a, this, this requires a, a lot more time than we're, we're giving it in a conversation. But the difference here is that the, uh, the, the trust that is responsible uh, for protecting the commons has a fiduciary duty to protect the commons. If they don't live up to their duty, citizens can sue them and have them removed and replaced. In order to protect the commons, the tool won't be selling rights. The tool will actually be defining limits. Uh, and what they will be doing is essentially allocating quotas. The word quota is a dirty word in capitalism. But when you have a finite planet, you need quotas, just like uh, there's a quota in, you know, if, if, if any, you, you go to any fishery that's collapsed and then been regenerated, um, it's because there's a quota system imposed that says we can only take X amount of fish out. And, and it's a con it's, it's a, there's always a dynamic changing context. So there's experts assessing the health and vibrancy of that fishery and adjusting the quotas in accordance with that new data. But it isn't what we're looking to do ultimately is to change the underlying behavior and the underlying demand anyway, like so that people aren't, um, aren't yeah. drilling oil, period. Yeah. But we, we don't have, we, we have carrots, but we don't have a stick. We need a stick. We're kidding ourselves if we think that Exxon's just gonna fold up shop and do the right thing. If we had the commons I'm describing, 
the stick would be there's a finite number of, of quotas to be allocated and you Exxon can bid for them, but the, the tighter the limit and we're, we would have a tight limit now, the more Exxon would have to pay for it, which would make more and more of their oil and gas reserves uneconomic, which is what we wanna have happen. And okay. it would make alternative energy so much more economic compared to the fossil fuels with the cost of the permit that it would accelerate investment. It would accelerate the transition off fossil fuels. But the key is that um, gov I, I don't believe governments because they're either corrupt, they're either literally corrupt or have been or are corruptible by special interests depending on the country you're in. Um, and they operate in a short-term election cycle or they're aut autocrats. Um, I don't believe the institution of government is capable of handling this problem. And if you look at how many cops are we at now, you know, the, the, I can't even keep track of it, but you know, the, the, the SDGs aren't being, uh, in fact, I just read there's a new, there's a new um, letter signed by a hundred scientists telling the UN to acknowledge the failure of the SDGs. Um, the Paris Accord, we're nowhere near living up to the commitments of the Paris Accord and the Paris Accord limits don't even address climate change. Um, there, aren't, there is no equivalent of the Paris Accord for the biodiversity crisis. The biodiversity needs to be protected as a commons. Again, it, it may not seem like a big deal that if we lose these bugs and lose these bees, oh, no. this, but it's a huge are, deal. Yeah. I think people are understanding more and more that-, yeah. um, that but, but there's no stick to say, no, 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 you can't do that. And I just, you know, I wish human nature were such that we wouldn't need a stick, but I, I, I think my years on Wall Street have chastened me or, or made me realistic enough to believe that, you know, the, the power of money needs to be met with comparable force uh, in order for it to be redirected. And I think we're shying away from that reality and pretending that if we set goals and ambitions and make speeches and give platitudes that it's going to change and it's not That's changing. That's because the moneyed powers don't want it to change, right? They're, they have a very, very big uh, power, impact, yeah. influence in our culture and in our government. Right. And uh, th that's true. And even the, uh, the good people in positions of economic power, and there are many, um, I, I don't know how to say this. Uh, it, it's like they literally can't see it because it's so um, it so undermines their their identity, their sense of you know. You walk up to any billionaire, you know, quote unquote billionaire, and tell them that the system upon which they made their fortune is uh, fundamentally unsustainable and unethical, and you're you're not gonna they can't they can't hear it because it says it undermines their own integrity. Um, you I know, want to ask you a dangerous question. Oh, I love dangerous questions. Are you hopeful? I, you know, that's, that's not a dangerous question. Um, uh, you know, you're asking in a tough week. Um, a really I, tough week. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time this week with, with the news. Um, really hard time, but, um, but that I will recover from that. It's like a body blow that we've all experienced and somehow time heals it a little bit if it's not as personal as it is for the, the victims, but. Um, and, and what we're talking about is the mass shootings, the yeah. two mass shootings that we've had in a very, very narrow space of time. Yeah. One blatantly racist and one blatantly, I don't even know what to describe, just evil. I mean, I don't know how to describe shooting fourth graders. Um, so, um, am I hopeful? Um, I, I, am, I am hopeful. I'm not optimistic. I think you'd be naive to be optimistic. Um, so why am I hopeful? Um, a couple reasons. One is that um, systems only change in response to pressure. 
And that's science, that's not my opinion. Um, you put a pot of water on the stove and turn up the heat and eventually it boils, it, it has to, um, or it explodes. If, it, if, it is, if, it's a, if it's got a top sealed on it and can't boil, it will explode. Um, and so uh, when, the, when the pressure builds enough, an earthquake happens. So the pressure is rising, which will force change. Now that doesn't mean the change will be what we want it to be, but, um, but it can't continue as the pressure continues to rise without changing. So it's an interesting opportunity for us to help, you know, in a, in a jujitsu way, redirect that energy in a, in a positive constructive way. It's, it's an incredible opportunity uh, to be alive at a moment when that's happening. If you think about the decades and centuries that have gone by where nothing basically happened, uh, this is a fascinating time to be alive and the stakes are huge. Um, the sex, so that's one reason. It's that it's not that it requires us to do stuff. We're going to be forced to do stuff because the pressure is rising. That's probably the most powerful reason to remain hopeful. Um, and, and then it's, you know, is it going to collapse or is it going to shift into a, a new positive, um, you know, what the scientists, complexity scientists call, are we going to be able to shift to a higher level of complexity? or are we gonna collapse down to a lower level of complexity? And frankly, if we collapse down to a lower level of complexity in the long term, that's not a terrible thing, um, right? You know, it, it, it would be very painful. There'll be a lot of, um, uh, uh, there'd be a lot of pain and agony. There already is a lot of pain and agony in a lot of parts of the world um, and a lot of parts of this country. So it, 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 you know, in a sense, we are already in this collapse and release phase of, of, the, of the system. But the other reason that I'm, uh, I'm hopeful is that the, uh, you know, the, the, there is apparently, I don't, I'm not an expert in this, but scientific validated quantifiable evidence that the collective consciousness of humanity is rising. And at the end of the day, that's what this is about. And so the question is, is the collective consciousness <coughs> going to rise fast enough to head off the entropic degenerative collapse that's otherwise inevitable? Yeah. And, and neither you nor I know the answer to that question. Nope. So I remain hopeful, but it's an act, it's, an, it's a verb. That. Thank you for that. So I know that uh, the Capital Institute has an educational program mm -hmm. for people that want to learn more about this new paradigm and how it applies. Um, could you just give us a brief description of the course and how people can find out about it? Yeah, I'd be excited to. We, we just finished the first cohort. Um, it, it was amazing, honestly. We had 350 people from two, wow. 20, 25 countries. <clears throat> with no marketing other than, you know, our distribution list and LinkedIn and word of mouth. Um, we had about 25 other thought leaders participating in dialogues yeah. with me. So it wasn't John Fullerton giving lectures, although there were some John Fullerton lectures that, you know, it was eight weeks and every week there was a, a topic and I would give it a, a lecture on a topic and then we'd have a discovery dialogue with a um, you know, really interesting, thoughtful person who has particular expertise in that area, many of which are in the regenerative space, but some of which aren't, um, uh, but, but their work was relevant to it. And, um, uh, but there was also a, a very intentional kind of personal consciousness shifting um, uh, aspect designed into the, into the program. And I was blown away what you can do on Zoom. You know, we, we would have 250 people on Zoom yeah. and the, the chat room is lit up the whole time and it, it was amazing and, and the feedback has been great. So um, if you're interested, go to capitalinstitute.org, our website, and write, you, you won't be able to miss the sign up here enrollment for the course. Uh, it's called Introduction to Regenerative Economics, a new way of seeing, uh, being, and managing in the 21st century, I think if I remember correctly. Well, the, the title is pretty explicit, but I'm wondering if you could just give us an idea of what, are the, what kind of takeaways, because we're getting a sense of this new way of thinking. Mm. What would, 
a takeaway from the course be? You know, I've, I've we, I'll, I'll just, I'll just go talk about two um, bits of feedback that 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 I received. One one in a letter from a um, thirty ish, thirty something, thirty five year old young woman uh, professional who said, you know, essentially this is the first time I've sensed hope in ten years. Wow. And she um, she worked in. Uh, works in private equity in alternative energy, but feels the discord the, or the, the the dissonance between, you know, the the drive to make money. You know, even though she's doing renewable energy, she's in the financial system where it's an extractive. It's all about making money um, culture, and and yet herself, she could feel her soul being, you know. She could feel the tension between her soul and her how to make a living. And um, she sent a, a beautiful, uh, you know, thank you note. She's off on a trip now to California to rethink everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then an, an executive from, um, I, I don't have his permission yet to use this quote, but, you know, think of a one of the leading sort of sustainability minded brands that is a household name senior executive who said effectively, I'll never be able to see the world or my place in it the same way. And this will affect how I lead forever. That's where we need to have that kind of change on all levels, but yeah. especially at the top of, of major companies. That's profound. Yeah, and I, I, to me, once they see this- You can't unsee it. You can't unsee it, and we're good. And, and they will spread it. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, humbled and proud that we're able to do this. I think the timing, again, this is an example. I, I could have tried to give this course five years ago and no one would have showed up. There's right. no question in my mind that the combination of the pandemic and climate change and the chaos, all of a sudden this is resonating, literally resonating in a way that it couldn't have in a different context. So that's an example of the pressures rising. And so the, the, what needs to happen will happen. And, and I hold on to that. Um, John, I'm wondering, I know we're short on time. I just wondering, I am just wondering if you have recommendations for people to read. Uh, I know you've written a, a tome here called Regenerative Capitalism, which I've read. And I'm wondering if there are other writings of yours that you would recommend or other writings to introduce people to. Yeah. This bigger notion. Um, well, we have a, a long list in the, in the course, um, and I'm I'm always hesitant to tick off names because then I'll forget. I'll, I'll it'll insult the ones I forget, but I but I'll do it anyway. Um, so I, on my work, there's there's two seminal papers really that are on our website. One is about economics that was written in 2015, and one is about finance, which is applying the same eight principles to the financial system. That one gets a bit more technical. Um, it's sort of really written more toward a finance audience, but um, but there's a lot of very basic fundamentals in there as well. Um, so that's my work. I'm working on a book, but I don't have a a, a book out yet. But I I think um, you know for, for me the a couple of the books that were kind of epiphany creating were the you know the limits to growth, which you know you can read a 50 year update summary of it um, if you just Google it online. Um, uh, Herman Daly's work. Uh, he's got a, a brilliant book that he wrote with John Cobb called For the Common Good, um, which was another kind of epiphany wake up call. He's the first economist to, uh, and he's an, un he's a, he is a trained economist, but they wouldn't let him, he would never get a PhD either <laughs> uh, today in his ecological economics, but he first introduced the idea of scale limits to economics. Um, and, and, you know, should, should have won a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and then, you know, the, what jumps out in my mind, there's a, a colleague who's, again, uh, part of the course, uh, his name is Jeremy Lent, and he's got two books now that are, um, you know, brilliant, massive, sweeping um, treatises to understand the long sweep of history on how we got to where we are. 
Um, one of them is called the patterning instinct, and the second one is called the web of meaning. And um, you know, if 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 I put it this way, if if those books existed ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So for those that. would be my recommendations. Awesome. Um, it has been such a treat to speak with you. I could I could speak with you for hours. I have so many more questions. Well, we'll have to get together again, maybe in person that. next time. Oh, that would be terrific. That would be yeah. wonderful. So well, thanks for uh, having me. It's been fun. Yeah. So uh, that's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin, and uh, this is the Sustainability Now podcast. And I just want to thank my um, partner in crime here and our producer, Scott Billy, and all of you who carry the torch and take this out into the world. Um, until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.